on Business Incorporated today. Netflix to invest $63 million in South Africa's film and television industry. Egypt seeks IMF support amid Ukraine crisis. And Democratic Republic of Congo set to become a member of the East Africa community. Hello, welcome to this program. This is Business Incorporated on Channel Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Let's check first with major equities in Africa. Sentiments were mostly in the red at intraday. Nigeria and South Africa exchanges traded in opposite directions. Nigeria's NGX fell. Very short stay there yesterday. It ended mildly up about a third of a percent. Our South Africa's JSE inched up 0.15%. At intraday, Egypt's benchmark performance index rose strongly. It was up almost 2%. Meanwhile, Nairobi Stock Exchange closed Wednesday's session negative. Over in the Middle East, uh, sentiments were positive. The flip side of what's going on in Africa, Abu Dhabi index rose 0.2%, while Dubai's index traded up 0.54%. Elsewhere in the region, South, Saudi Arabia and Qatar indexes rose 0.02% and 0.79% each as intraday. And uh, going to Europe now, Russia has announced that it will only accept rubles for gas deals with European countries. With a high dependence of most European countries on Russian gas, the picture seems a bit complicated. Well, we'll have Chelsea to unpack that for us. She joins us from Berlin. So, uh, Chelsea, what does this mean for Europe's energy supply? It's definitely a major threat to the EU's energy security already. Uh, energy supplies, particularly of natural gas, have been very stretched. We keep in mind Russia is the biggest supplier of natural gas to the EU. It accounts for about 40% of natural gas imports. And for a lot of companies and European <clears throat> countries, this is going to create a, a major dilemma. So right now, they're paying um, they're paying Russia in, in euros for that natural gas. To change that, they would have to uh, basically renegotiate their contracts. What we've heard from a lot of European EU countries already is, is that they don't want to do that because it, it would be essentially helping Russia evade sanctions. It would also be uh, quite clearly a way for Russia to use European um, countries to uh, increase demand for its ruble and it ultimately prop up its currency and economy. We've heard from Germany that, um, they, that they will talk to other EU countries about whether this is a breach of contract and how to go forward. Italy has said that they won't do it, that they won't um, pay in rubles because that would be undermining the sanctions they have against the Russian regime. It would basically uh, be tantamount to funding Russia's war. Austria as well has joined in. Some other EU countries are a little bit more reluctant. For example, Bulgaria says that they could, in theory, um, pay in rubles. But uh, for now, this is definitely raising the prospect of um, short term short-term disruptions to energy supply as well. It could speed the, the it, it could force other EU countries, uh, especially here in the European Union, to say, okay, actually, we're just going to um, speed up our, our, our plans to transition away from Russian natural gas. So uh, there, this definitely could have huge implications for EU's energy supply. Obviously, it will have a huge implication. But how's the market taking this news? It's definitely um, having a big impact on, on global markets. We saw natural gas prices here in the EU shoot up by about 30% yesterday. Um, today also rising once again. As well, we saw the ruble uh, rise by about 10% after the announcement yesterday. So clearly, investors do see that there, that there could be more demand for rubles as an account of that. Um, stocks have responded with a little bit more uh, um, caution. So investors are, are not quite seeing this as, you know, a major problem for uh, the EU economy at this point. But it is, of course, um, going to raise the risk of, you know, natural gas shortages. And, and we're definitely seeing that reflected in, in energy markets. And uh, meanwhile, the president of uh, the United States, Joe Biden, is in Europe and is expected to announce a deal to boost 
EU energy supplies. Uh, any ideas what that will look like? So there aren't a lot of deals yet on, or there aren't a lot of details, excuse me, yet on what that deal would look like. Essentially what Biden and, and um, the EU is talking about is an, an agreement that would increase supplies of U.S. liquefied natural gas to the EU. How much, what that would cost, those are details that they haven't really announced yet. But what is clear from um, from the Biden administration is that they want to be providing more natural gas to the EU. They want to help them um, move forward with those plans to ditch Russian gas. And, and they say that actually this LNG could be arriving within months. Uh, and that is quite um, quite good news for the EU, given how short, how, how short in supply they are of natural gas. But I'd also note that, you know, the U.S. isn't the only one who's stepping in here. We've also seen um, Germany, for example, reaching deals with Qatar for a more natural gas. Um, a lot of these are more focused on the long-term supply, um, but per, in particular, the U.S. could sort of step in in, in, the, in the coming months and help ease some of these, uh, these gas supply problems, particularly um, as things continue to worsen between the EU and Russia. All right, Chelsea, thank you so much for that update. Let's move to the UK now. Uh, while Putin is telling Europe to pay for Russian gas and rubles, the UK has announced a, announced a new set of sanctions against Russian companies. Uh, Juliana, good afternoon. So tell us about these new sanctions. Yeah, good afternoon, Eni. Just as um, uh, NATO members are congregating in Brussels, as you were saying, US President Joe Biden is there so they can try and f uh, find a solution to this month-long bombardment um, of Ukraine by Russia. Uh, Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, has announced a further a set of sanctions against 60 um, individuals, business elites and um, key strategic sectors all linked um, to the Kremlin. Uh, this new um, announcement does put up the number to over 1,000. So over 1,000 businesses, companies and individuals have been sanctioned uh, by the UK over the past uh, uh, four weeks. There are some big names and some big firms in, in terms of the tabloids. And we know Britain is a tabloid loving nation. One of the names on there that sparked a lot of interest is a lady called Polina Kov Leveva. Now, she is a 26 year old a stepdaughter of Sergei Lavrov, who's a foreign minister of Russia. According to reports, um, her mother um, is uh, the uh, other wife of Sergei Lavrov. She is an Imperial College London uh, a graduate, 26 years old, um, is very senior at Gazprom, um, and she has a £4 million property in West London. We'll know more because uh, all of her assets have been frozen. There are also six uh, banks uh, that have been frozen uh, today, um, including Alpha Bank, which is the largest private bank in Russia. Another big name on uh, the 60-strong list is Al Rosa. That's the world's largest a diamond company um, and another big name is the Wagner Group. Now it, this uh, group has been described as Putin's private army and during uh, this uh, month-long bombardment they've allegedly uh, been tasked with assassinating uh, President Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian leader there. Um, so yes, uh, those um, have been mentioned. Again, Britain doing its best to try and uh, squeeze the neck of the Kremlin, uh, uh, so to speak, and it does come at a time when NATO members are gathering and Britain des definitely wants to be able to put its uh, foot first to say that it is leading uh, the, the Western world in tightening the grip um, on Vladimir Putin. Yeah, a lot, a lot of investigation going on there, you know, to like scratch into it. Well, in the morning, we talked about uh, the rising prices. How's the market reacting to all of those uh, fuel cuts, fuel duty cuts, uh, the rising prices and all? Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty mixed um, at the moment at intraday. The all shares down. That's down by 0.08%. The FTSE 100 is up by 0.22%. And then the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's down by 0.62%. In the currencies market, the British pound is currently trading up against the US dollar by 0.02%. It's also trading up against the euro by about 0.12% and up again against the Japanese yen by 0.45%. Uh, uh, now, uh, the house builders... 
they are dragging the FTSE blue chip uh, much lower because a, a, a huge city um, uh, investor has said that uh, house builders should be the ones to pay for cladding. I don't know if you cast your mind back at that awful tragedy in Grenfell, um, which was a tower block in uh, west of London, just a couple of minutes from where our studio is. Um, now, the cladding, which uh, sparked uh, the, the, the fire, well, it didn't spark the fire, but it certainly made the fire spread more uh, rapidly and swiftly. There has been a debate about who is going to be responsible for taking them down amongst um, communities in London, because several homes do have cladding. Um, because of this city investors' remarks, those shares are down. And then we also did have an announcement from Shell earlier this morning saying that over the next decade, they plan to invest £25 billion into the UK's green economy. Um, and their shares uh, swiftly rose because of that. Yeah, well, at least some good news in the midst of it. Thank you so much, Juliana. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Still in the markets now, Asia-Pacific markets struggled for direction as oil prices saw volatile trading following yesterday's 5% jump. Shares in Singapore outperformed the broader Asia-Pacific region, with the Straits Times Index climbing around 0.8%. Those gains came as the country's prime minister announced plans to ease COVID-19 restrictions. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index closed 0.94%, lower 21,945.95. Shares of Chinese tech giant Tencent dropped 5.91% in Hong Kong after the firm yesterday posted its lowest revenue growth on record. Tencent also said it is exploring a financial holding company for which pay, if required by Chinese regulators. Other Chinese tech stocks in Hong Kong were also lower, with Alibaba falling 3.23%, and net ease slipping over 2%. In mainland China, the Shanghai composite declined 0.63% to end the trading day at 3,250.26. Other Shenzhen components shed 0.83% to 12,305.50. The Nikkei 225 in Japan recovered earlier losses to close 0.25% higher at 28,110.39, adding to its 3% jump from yesterday. Topix index gained 0.14% to 1,981.56. South Korea's Kospi slipped 0.2% on the day to 2,729.66. In Australia, the S&P AX200 climbed 0.12%, finishing its trading day at 7,387.10. MCSI's Brodex index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan traded 0.54% lower. In the United States, stock futures rose in early trade as investors tried to recover from declines in previous session. Dow Jones Industrial Average features climbed 150 points. S&P 500 and Nasdaq 100 features climbed 0.6% and 0.7% respectively. Streaming service Spotify rose 3.7% in extended trading. The move comes as NATO leaders meet in Brussels to try to find ways to put more pressure on Russia. And uh, in Angola, going to the oil space now, the Angola, Angola has reviewed its rules for payments on the insurance and reinsurance contracts involving operators in the oil and gas sector. As of the 15th of March 2022, those involved in contracting insurance and reinsurance, namely commercial banks, operators in the oil and gas sector and insurance and reinsurance companies must comply with the new rules on the penalty of fines of up to $100,000. Transactions between insurance and reinsurance company and operators in the oil and gas sector relating to contracting of up and midstream energy insurance include reimbursement of return premiums and payment of claims. And uh, still in that, uh, around the oil space, crude oil prices declined in volatile trading as investors assessed the potential for new supply in tight markets amid a prospect of a new Iran deal. Brent features down 15 cents at $121.45 a barrel. U.S. West Texas intermediate features also fell 75 cents to $114.18 a barrel. And that's after it shed $2 earlier. The contract had gained $2 and, $2 and $1 respectively. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has said that the United States and its allies have made progress in Iran nuclear talks, but issues remain. A lifting of Iranian export restrictions will help alleviate the immense tightness 
prevalent in crude markets at the moment. Iran is already preparing for a ramp up in exports, and the state refiner NIOC has reportedly started to reach out to former key customers in India and South Korea. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we have more stories for you on the African continent. To stay with us, this is Business Incorporated on Channels Television. Welcome back to Business Incorporated on Channels Television. Well, the Russian-Ukraine conflict has put a lot of pressure on global food supply as the Black Sea area affected by the conflict is responsible for 12% of food calories that's traded globally already. There's an increase in price of wheat, maize, disruption in Bali, supply to China, and a whole lot happening in that commodity space. Where we'll, we have Lawrence Messi, analyst with Financial Derivatives Company, joining us uh, to expatiate on this. Hi, Lawrence. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, about a month or so, no, over a month now, we had uh, the pyramid, rice pyramid in Abuja, the federal capital of Nigeria. Uh, but we see the price of rice now it's skyrocketing. Is it safe to say that the impact of the war has overtaken the benefits of that one million bags of rice that were displayed at, at the pyramid or as pyramids? Um, well... Earlier, or yesterday, you could have said that that was the case. But as of this morning, a report released by Narametrics um, containing data sets on the prices of commodities in local markets actually reveals that the price of local rice, 50 kg bags of local rice, has actually reduced from about 30,750 naira to about 25,375 naira. Rather, the increase in price is being experienced in the foreign bags that we are importing, and that's largely due to maybe increase in fertilizer costs as well as um, import charges as well. Um, another thing you could also look at is the fact that Ukraine and Russia, though significant exporters of greens and other agricultural commodities such as wheat, barley, rye, sunflower seeds, etc., they are not combined or even individual um, significant exporters of rice. And as such, that hasn't really caused a significant jump in the price of foreign bags of rice. So with this picture you have painted now, the local rice and then the imported rice and looking at the taste of Nigerians, which one they prefer more, what's your outlook or long-term, short-term outlook for rice and food sustainability in the country? Well, my outlook is largely stable to be honest, but it depends on energy costs. Well, um, oil price is currently at $114 for um, WTI and $121 for Brent. And these energy costs are used in fertilizer production. So as long as they stay high, then well, cost of fertilizers will be high and it also transfer to planting costs as well. But considering that there, is, um, there seems to be an advantage in local production, then food prices might remain low. But that's just for rice. You also have to look at other commodities. So, aside rice, onions, and yams, well, the prices of other commodities such as vegetable oils, palm oils, peppers have actually increased, though marginally. So, I think there would kind of be a balancing effect across all commodities. But it would be good to monitor energy costs for now and look at um, the impact that the new Dangote refinery or fertilizer plant rather might have on um, stabilizing fertilizer supply in Nigeria. Exactly. I mean, mentioning that uh, at a time when fertilizer globally, the price at record highs, what are your expectations and how soon do you expect uh, the benefit of the fertilizer plants to sip into the agriculture sector of the country? I think in order for us to appreciate the productive fertilizer plant, I'd like to put some context so, um, Russia and China Hello, Lawrence. Um, Hello, Lawrence. Hello, Lawrence. Can you hear me? Yes, can I, can. I can hear okay. you. Okay. I, I don't know. Your audio is a bit distorted. I can barely hear what you're saying. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know what happened. Maybe 
the network uh, uh, just dropped a bit there. So we'll see if we can get Lawrence back uh, to complete his thoughts. Meanwhile, Egypt is seeking support from the International Monetary Fund, possibly including a new loan as its economy comes under pressure amid fallout from Russia's war in Ukraine. Egypt's cabinet says the country has requested discussions on a new program that may include additional financing. Meanwhile, IMF mission chief Selin Alad says that fund staff are working closely with officials in Cairo to prepare for talks on a program that would mitigate the impact of this shock on the Egyptian economy. Egypt is one of the Middle East's most indebted nations and a major food importer. Surging prices of energy and grains as a result of the Ukraine war, along with rising interest rates in developed country, have in increased the risks to its economy. This week, the central bank allowed the Egyptian pound, which had been stable against the dollar for about two years, to weaken by more than 15%. It also raised interest rates for the first time since 2017. However, IMF welcomes the authorities' recent actions to expand target social protection and implement exchange rate flexibility in the country. The RFC finally joins EAC next week, three years after formal application. The Democratic Republic of Congo will officially join a six-nation East Africa community, adding its more than 90 million market population to the regional trading bloc. This is after approval by heads of state summit, nearly three years after making a formal application in June 2019 at an extraordinary summit, which will be preceded by the 48th extraordinary meeting of the Council of Ministers. And that will be tomorrow, Friday, the 25th of March. The mineral-rich country already has established trade ties with most of the EAC member states through bilateral deals and at multilateral level, where it is affiliated to Southern African Development Community, where Tanzania is a member. DRC is already a key African market for Kenyan firms. And uh, latest official annual data showing export earnings from DRC amounted to 14.3 billion shillings in 2020, only dwarfed by Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Egypt, and South Sudan. All right, I, I learned we have Lawrence back now. Hello, Lawrence. Could you just finish up your thoughts? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, thank you. So I said you had to fully appreciate the Dangote fertilizer plant. It's good to put some context into this. Okay. So Russia and China accounts for about 24.4% of global fertilizer exports. Now, a lot of countries have imposed trade bans on Russia, and China has actually banned exportation of fertilizer due to the increasing energy costs and prices so that they can sustain domestic consumption. So that leaves the world with about 75.6% in fertilizer exports to satisfy an already deficit demand. So the Dangote um, fertilizer plant would provide 3 million tons of fertilizer annually. And I think that that can really offset the deficit that's been left by the absence of these two major countries that are major exporters of fertilizer. And if this is successful and efficient, then we can expect food supply to be stable, all things being equal with security and logistics constraints outside. But I guess with the new fertilizer plants, we can expect that there will be stable production and there will also be increased export revenues, as it's been said, that some of these fertilizer will be exported to African countries, Brazil, and the United States. Well, uh, that just as you mentioned, Lawrence, economists say all other things being equal, we will watch out and see what's, what happens in the fertilizer space. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Just before we go, Netflix is set to invest $63 million in South Africa's film and television industry. Global streaming giant uh, is turning its attention to South Africa as it looks to boost subscriber numbers on the continent. The company will pump 920 million. 9 million rand, that's uh, $63 million into the creatives by 2023, with the funds covering one international production and three local shows. The contribution of the film industry to the economy of South Africa is projected to be 2.91 billion rand in 2020-2021, and that's a reduction from what it was in 2019-2020, which is 7.18 billion rand. That's it on the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of it.
Do it again tomorrow. I'm Ini John Mekwa.